After surviving the console wars of the 1990s, the Bit War veterans are invading your podcast to bring you gaming intel and old tales. Together, we are your hosts, Max Inventory and Miao Tae Ching, and we are the, the Bit War Veterans. Hello and welcome to another very special episode where today it is all about the means in which we interface with our digital realms. Controllers. The controller. First, we're going to talk about some new controllers coming out. New controllers for retro systems. And then we have a very special guest, Kevin Harbin. Discussing his recently released book, The Evolution of Game Pads. And I don't think you're going to want to miss out on this interview or that book. And then closing off the episode, we feature your tweets. You tell us the tales of your favorite controllers, your least favorite controllers, some weird controllers and add-ons that you've had. We have a really, really wide range of controllers and opinions on these controllers. It's great. So stick around and join us on our journey through time. Press X to continue. Earlier this month, I was scrolling through Twitter, and I had the thought in my head, wow, just think about all those old NES Zapper controllers. They don't work on modern HD TVs anymore. You know, they only work with CRT TVs because they're light guns. And as I was thinking this, I scrolled down and saw the news that the company Hyperkin is developing a controller just like the NES Zapper that works on modern HD TVs. It's called the Hyper Blaster HD. Now they announced this controller right before CES. Now unfortunately there isn't that much news on it, but we do have some info for you. As of right now, it works with the original NES hardware and you're able to play Duck Hunt with it. In the future, we suspect that the list of game compatibility will grow, but as of right now, Duck Hunt is the only game that they've confirmed that it works with. That's so strange because there's something like, I don't know, 13 or so light gun games for Nintendo. I guess they're still figuring out the technology. But the light gun will come with an adapter that allows you to connect it to your HD TV. And a few people got to try this out at CES. Hyperkin was there. And according to them, the light gun comes in a bright orange with gray accents and a black trigger. They say it feels and looks very, very close to the original NES Zapper controller. The trigger pull doesn't feel quite exactly like the original, but they say it has a very satisfying click. Yes, the Zapper trigger was very fulfilling. I still have one. Definitely makes you feel good when you're shooting those ducks. I have no idea if it still works, though. I haven't played with that in a long time. When we hear more news from Hyperkin, we'll let you know. But as of right now, that's the only news we have about this really cool new piece of technology for old systems. There was no release date? There's no release date as of now. Okay. Well, that's kind of good because right now, for working on only one game, it's a little strange. Now, what else I had heard about this is that it only works with the original system and not with... Like the Retron, you know, and some of these um, emulation retro systems. Yeah, that's correct. It only works on original hardware. So that's kind of kind of funny, because then you have to have the original NES most likely hooked up with a Frame Meister or some kind of HDMI upscaling device, and and then you go ahead. And, it seems like a lot of trouble. If they can figure out number one how to work with other games, and then number two to work also on the emulation uh, retro systems, I think they could really have something here. Right, because light gun games just don't work that well or at all on HD TVs and there's plenty of people out there who absolutely love these kinds of games and you know they're missing out unless you have a CRT TV. And not a lot of them were good either so hopefully too they can find a workaround for like the Super Nintendo and PlayStation 1 where we also had better and more popular light gun games. And in other news if you go to RetroFighters.com 
you will find the wonderfully produced and recently released Brawler 64. Nintendo 64, I guess you want to call it Pro Controller? (laughs) That's the best way of putting it, yeah. But it's an updated Nintendo 64 controller that will work with the hardware, designed more like a modern controller where you've got a very nice-looking analog thumbstick on the left and all your buttons oriented on the right. The D-pad is still there, fits in your hand without needing three hands, and they've also released it in five different colors to match the many different colored Nintendo 64 consoles out there. They've got the blue, the purple, the red, the orange, and the green with that transparent style sure to match your favorite N64 console. And of course, it also comes in classic gray. Now, I haven't played with one of these, but I think it's really exciting and I think it would breathe new life into our old N64. This design looks like it makes sense. And it comes with Z triggers on both sides of the controller, kind of like an L and R buttons. And it comes with turbo that you could switch on and off. So that's a really cool addition too. Your rumble pack and your memory packs are compatible in this controller. They do. They do have a slot for those. So that's really awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to trying one of these. I think we're going to have to pick one or two up in the future, near future here. And I think right now on Amazon, they're looking for only about 32 and a half bucks, normally $40. So that's that's not bad at all. Not at all. For something that'll probably last longer than other reproductions of the classic design. Continue to keep your eyes on RetroFighters.com because coming in June this year, they have the Brawler Gen 2-in-1 Sega Genesis and Saturn controller, which also includes a little analog stick just under the D-pad for those games on Saturn that utilize the Nights into Dreams controller. And of course, it's six buttons along with the shoulder buttons. And I love that it's dual compatible with both systems. This is a really smart looking, fun design. And of course, they have a couple other items for sale if you want to check them out at RetroFighters.com. We are not sponsored by them, but we just think they're pretty cool. (laughs) And we thought you'd like it too. This being our controller episode and all. Speaking of Sega Genesis controllers, Retrobit is a company that's brought back many devices and other retro video game items. They seem to also be bringing back original Sega Genesis and Saturn controllers. But with a twist, they're making Bluetooth wireless versions of these controllers. You just plug your dongle into the original system and there you go. You're set up. They're also making USB versions. Great for your little retro Pi systems or your PC. Definitely. Also for the Sega Saturn in both the USB PC wired and wireless. And they're even stepping it up a notch and putting out Sega Dreamcast controllers. Ooh. Now, is it just the controller or does it come with like a new type of VMU? No, I don't think they're producing VMUs. Aw. It looks like we've got wired USB and Bluetooth wireless versions of the controllers in white or black. And if that wasn't enough, Retrobit also seems to be stepping up their clone system game and confirmed that they are working with Sega to produce what looks like a reproduction of the Sega Nomad, but also updated for the modern age. What does that possibly mean? Well, if you remember, the Sega Nomad was basically a handheld Sega Genesis. You'd slap your cartridges in the top and you'd have it on the go. You could even plug it to a television. It also used to eat batteries like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. So now, ideally, we're going to have an updated battery, hopefully chargeable through USB. Hopefully they'll have an HDMI out. And I'm hoping the screen will be a little bit bigger. Even if it's not bigger, more more it color, be. brighter, yes, more a vibrant. higher quality. Yes. Not much is known about it, but there is a rumored price point that it would be around eighty dollars. That's not bad at all. Heck yeah, I'd pick one up. This would be really interesting to have, and especially too if you can plug other controllers into it or a second controller at least. So if you do have it plugged to a TV or you're playing handheld mode, <laughs> portable mode, you know you can play with a friend. Yeah, this definitely sounds really promising, and I, I think it's great that we're now living in the age of uh, retro controllers coming back to life, being able to use new technology on old stuff. Uh, I think we're kind of in like uh, a retro renaissance or something. (laughs) It's also possible that if you have one of those nifty EverDrives, you slap that in this and you've pretty much got the whole Sega library on the go. Not too bad. I find it really interesting. Right. You know what else is interesting? Kevin Harbin's book, The Evolution of Game Pads. Now, we have him on the show for you, doing a really great interview, walking us through all the controllers he's researched throughout gaming history. He starts at the very, very beginning, and his book features 
wonderful color photographs from his own personal collection of all these different types of controllers. First-party controllers, third-party controllers, really weird stuff you've never seen before. It's definitely really interesting. Without further ado, let's conduct the interview. Press start. Mr. Kevin Harbin. You can also reach him on Twitter, at Kevin Harbin, but that's H-A-R-B-N. And today we're going to discuss his new book about the evolution of controllers throughout the ages. It's called The Evolution of Gamepads, and it just came out earlier last month. And how is this available for purchase right now? Uh, You can get that on Amazon or through the publisher, uh, Book Baby, and generally anywhere you can find books online is carrying it. All right, Kevin. So first off, I just want to do a quick intro here, and we're, we want to know basically who you are, what you do, and what got you interested in video games in the first place. Sure, absolutely. Well, my, my day job is I'm an electrical engineer, and I work for a company that works in the mining and chemicals industries. We just help our clients with um, anything they need upgraded or updated or added. I love that job. I've been doing that for a decade now. It's been good stuff. I have played video games for you know, about as long as I can remember. The first console I ever played was the NES with Mario and, and Duck Hunt. I did a lot of MAME emulation back when that was first getting hot. Um, love Galaga. That's probably my most favorite game. And you know, just eventually I had my, I think the PlayStation was probably my first first console that I owned, and that's where it started. Okay, and what got you interested in writing about things related to gaming? Were you a writer before that, or did this just kind of come in your head one day? Yeah, I would say the, the beginning of this project is not so much that I like to write. It's, it was more, I started, you know, I was with games, and I, you know, even more than just playing the games, I like the stuff around the games. You know, I like the way they look, and I like the way they feel, and I like the boxes that stuff come in, and uh, the artwork that goes along with it. I wanted to do the idea, the evolution of gamepads, but more like on my wall. I would have a physical copy of all the controllers and, you know, show how they changed through the ages. And that was, that was an idea that I had, and it was very naive. I hadn't really considered how many different controllers there were. And, you know, as I, as I started looking about how I would put that together, I realized that it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna work the way I had imagined it. And so it went from there to thinking about put, taking pictures of them and putting them together and then seeing if I could get some backstories. You know, I thought I had originally thought about putting little plaques underneath each controller just to talk a little bit about it and so it's fleshed out from there and if nothing else it was a project for myself that I wanted to have completed and I thought there's probably an audience interested as well. So do you also get into actual design and build quality of the controllers? Yeah that's you know certainly a part a big part of how controllers have changed like the the original Genesis controllers had some serious wear issues and you know we're familiar with the the analog stick on the Nintendo 64 controller wears out pretty quickly. Definitely. And so that's a thing that's you know, certainly changed over the years. So in your book, like where in gaming history do you start us on this journey? Are you talking about like the Atari 2600? Does it start with Pong consoles? Do you look into some of those like pre-gaming systems like Tennis for Two and those other weird computer games that came out way back in the 50s and 60s. Like, where does this start? Yeah, I know the ones you're talking about. So I started it at what I would consider the very beginning, and that's with Space War. That was written for one of the first, like, a mainframe computers, the PDP-1. Okay, all the way. All the way back. So, you know, there's, there's some discussion about what's the first video game. And maybe even what's the first controller. But this is kind of what I feel is the very first one. The college students who wrote that game, Space War, which is a lot like Asteroids. Asteroids was developed 
from Space Orc. That was where it came from. And the way that they played it the very beginning was there's a big board with a bunch of switches on it and the two players, it was a two player game, the two players would have to kind of reach across each other to play the game. And so these enterprising uh, college students built themselves little little controllers that have two switches and a button on it. And that to me is the very first gamepad. So that's where I start. And I, I stayed away a little bit from those Pong games and that sort of, if it was a, a dedicated video game system, it sort of didn't really fit in the theme of the book of trying to be a, which is become more multi-purpose. So Space War is very dedicated, but to me that's that's the first gamepad. So that's the patient zero, and then yeah, we kind of yeah. move on through. Uh, it sounds like focusing mainly on the whole console systems. Yeah. So then I try to hit every every major console system from then on and include the the, the main controller that went with it, and then any try to touch on at least any updates or other first party controllers that went along with that system. And I want to go all the way to the Joy-Con for Nintendo, the Nintendo Switch. Okay, excellent. Well then let's, without giving too much of the book away, do you want to take us through a little gestalt of all the main points you hit on there throughout time? Yeah, there's a few eras. There's the early era where it's the first major main release of a video game controller is from the Magnavox Odyssey. That was a f- your first home video game system that had more than one game and had a controller. And it's this giant white block with dials on the side. And it does what you need to do for that game, as extremely limited as the games that came on that hardware were. <laughs> and then it moves to kind of bringing the arcade world home. So it's a joystick, a small joystick, and your action button. And that goes for a few generations until Sega has a system, the SG-100, 1000? The SG-1000, which is more like that gamepad that we remember. Kind of a rectangle shape with, there's a joystick and then some buttons on the side. And then after that, the next, set is probably four players at a time. So before it was two at most, and then you get to multiplayer games. I've got a section in the book about multi-taps as they were pretty important. And then it just steps through each of the each of the console systems with a picture about the of the controller and then a write-up about highlighting some of the features. Okay, and did you have your own collection of these controllers? Are these things that you've bought over time. Oh yeah, certainly. I have almost every controller that's in the book and and most of them are are actual photographs of my collection. I've got four big rubbermaid tubs full of controllers. I I still would like one day to put them all up on a wall. That that still would be my goal. Ooh, that'd be a fun display project. Yeah, if I can figure it out. So were there any controllers that were difficult to either collect or research because of their rarity or obscurity? There's a couple that I don't have, like the Vectrix controller. To get one, it's almost the same price to buy one by itself as it is to buy a system that comes with it. I can't quite justify 300 plus dollars to add one controller to my collection. So was the NES controller the first true D-pad controller, or was there something that came before that that used a D-pad? You know, I I believe, I mean, technically, technically, the Nintendo Famicom came (laughs) before the NES, so technically, but yes, that that family was the first true gamepad. The Sega Master System pretty much rolled with that. Yep, that's, that's correct. And uh, so, I, so Sega had a, did have a system in between. Sega had the SG-1000 and the, the second controller they released for that system was a, a pad very similar to the NES style. And everybody's kind of followed that style until we got to analog sticks. And that's where I started, was an Atari 2600 with the really rigid joystick, one button. We also had the paddle games. Yeah, built to last. And then there was that funny the LSD kind of era of controllers with Coleco and Television. Yeah. And even the Atari 5200 with their strange number pad 
controllers. I never owned one of those, but... Yeah, it's an interesting idea. I had a friend who had a Coleco, and I was like, what is this thing? You know, so that was the, the wild west of video games, of seeing what thing would stick to, you know, keep yourself popular and have enough buttons for all the different games that might come out. So, you know, that's, that's part of you know, the early days is we didn't know what game was going to be released for that system. So you kind of wanted that controller to be able to do whatever a designer might want. Right. So you think they started including these number pads because they thought games were just going to be that much more complex to justify having a bunch of numbers? You know, I think, you know, at some point it was someone was like, well, let's just put a bunch more buttons and let somebody else sort it out. And then other companies sort of followed suit. Hey, look, they've got a number pad. I guess we should probably do that too. And it, it died its graceful death with the Jaguar. And then we had all those fun overlays. Yep, so I've, I've got some of those overlays in here as well because I thought that's pretty important. Some very colorful overlays and some that aren't so much. The 5200 are a little more boring, but the Intellivision overlays are they are very pretty for what they were. And around this time, we also see a lot of home computers coming out, and I'm just curious if your book includes any controllers and accessories for some of the popular home computer systems. I have not included any of those, the home okay. the home game pads. So you're like strictly a console guy. Strictly consoles, for this book anyway. There you go. <laughs> Is book number two going to be about home computers? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't quite figured out what that's going to be. Now that I've pulled this off and it worked as well as I, as it did, there's probably going to be a, a book too about something. I don't know what it is yet though. So Nintendo comes out with their D-pad. They revolutionize how people control games. Then the next generation comes out. Super Famicom, Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, whatever you call it. People like these controllers. They're comfortable. They have a special place in our hearts. And definitely the design of the controller was so good, it helped make the system be popular. People liked playing games on these systems. Certainly, yeah. They really did do a very good job of looking at what worked and what needed to be improved. You know, we went from very angular to something that fits more smoothly in your hand. Uh, they brought more buttons, and this is again trying to be able to bring the popular arcade games to home. And so around this time, fighting games were pretty popular. And having, that's, you know, the Genesis controller started off with three buttons, but in order to be able to have these fighting games with all the com combinations, they did the six buttons, which matched what the Super Nintendo was already doing. And some, I am. I know I love these controllers, just let, just like you were saying, but I'm not sure whether I love them because they did a great job with it, or if I love them because I'm the right age for it. When it comes to these systems too, they had lots of even first party variants on controllers, like the NES. Mm -hmm. You know, they went off into the, the NES Advantage, like the arcade stick style. Did you cover any of these? I do have a section about some of the some third-party controllers not so much the arcade joystick style tried to stick a little bit more to the gamepad theme i mean i've got 20 30 pages of these third-party controllers and i'm just scratching the surface with what's okay actually available because there was one for nintendo that i had seen but never had a chance to get my hands on which was the nes max it had instead of the d-pad had a you could almost call like an early analog stick or kind of resembles what's on the, the 3DS right now. They call it like the cycloid pad or something like that. Did you happen to go over that one? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, that one. The NES, yes. Uh, and that is included. That's that pad. So that was the NES Max. That's a game pad with that little disc thing that slides around. What are your insights on that one? Because I think that was kind of ahead of its time and I've always wondered how it actually handled. Yeah. Um, the, I would say the main drawback on that is the disc doesn't auto center at all. Oh wow! So if you you know you take your thumb off of it and you're holding it at any angle, it's just gonna fall to the bottom. Oh really? Just kind of lags like a lazy eye. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a good idea. There's a few like that one. There's there's another set of controllers, the Turbo Touch 360. They made three controllers: one for the NES, one for the Genesis, and one for the Super Nintendo. And it's got a touchpad there, so instead of pressing up and down, left and right. You just place your thumb on that disc and it'll 
register those buttons. But it has the same problem. Was the Sega Genesis controller the black and yellow one? Yes, ex yes, exactly that one. Yes. Just in a similar way, it's a different experience than your standard controller where you, you just rest your thumb on the D-pad and when you need to make a quick movement, you hit the button. Here, you would kind of need to keep your thumb off, otherwise you're registering movements the whole time. Which for, like, you know, Contra, where you're always running forward, it's not really a problem because you're just always running forward. So then in the 90s, we had a handful of consoles that unfortunately didn't quite make it out alive. We had the TurboGrafx-16, the 3DO, CDI, Atari Jaguar. The Amiga CD32. Let's not forget that one. Oh. <laughs> so what do you think about their controllers? Were they designed well or did their controllers kind of aid to their destruction? Hey, that's a good question. I think that the controllers for those were probably one of the smaller impacts on the console. It's like the 3DO controller. It looks, it's pretty standard. It, it has a button layout a lot like the original Genesis controller, but it was hard to get good buy-in for making games on the system. Wasn't it the CDI that also had that weird kind of remote control type of controller? Yeah, it was. Yes, it was very weird. It was like a pre-DVD menu. <laughs> yeah, it was like a long rectangle and a almost like a disc on the end. Yeah. Sort of. Like a fishing reel on the side. Oh, speaking of fishing reels, did you cover any of Sega's fishing reel controllers? <laughs> yes. You know, I think that should be its own book all by itself. <laughs> no, like I would I would love to have be able to cover like uh the fishing reels, all the different gun cons, guitar hero, uh train simulator controllers, all of that. I, I would love to be able to get all that done, but partly I want to own everything that I put in a book and I haven't started buying all that yet. So the the SNES comes along and changes the game with our shoulder buttons. They made it rounder cuz you know, the old NES controller tend to dig into our hands with those sharp corners. But then along comes PlayStation. I think I'd like to touch on how PlayStation, well, they started off kind of basic, uh, but then really changed the game with the, yeah. you know, the DualShock analog sticks and how that pitted against the N64 controller. We can start really early. Probably remember the that Sony was going to work with Nintendo to work, make this CD add-on for the Super Nintendo. So they were already in the headspace of video game consoles, and then that didn't work out so well. I've got I have a Sony design book lying around here somewhere uh, that shows 50 different design iterations that Sony went through to get to the controller that they ended up with on the PlayStation. And most of them are flat like the standard gamepad was. But actually early on in the development, the designer had made this very similar to what we ended up with, with the handles that hang down for holding and then the button layout and he had shown that design to his boss not his boss his boss's boss who saw it and kind of liked it and then you know went away and the designer got other feedback and moved it back towards that flat design and then closer to the release it went back up to the boss's boss to show how the console was progressing and uh he was you know handed this flat controller and he goes wait a minute this isn't what we were doing. I like that that handle design. And so near the end of the design cycle, they went back and gave us these handles again. And they've lasted all the way through to now. So then we also had the N64 and their wacky controller design. But it added that crucial analog stick that stuck around for <laughs> becoming kind of a basically a standard for interacting with these new 3D games. <laughs> I almost feel like the Nintendo 64 controller was designed around playing Mario 64, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. You know, Nintendo has done a lot of new things with their controllers. You know, the, they started that the D plus button that came on the, the Game & Watch Donkey Kong game. And that's, they started that. Uh, they put six buttons on the controller on the Super Nintendo. And, Sega had to follow suit. They brought analog to a controller and Sony had to follow suit. They had a rumble pack and Sony had to follow suit. And Nintendo has done, even if their first, 
way of doing it. It hasn't isn't really the right way. It it brings it to the table and everybody else has to look at it and say, all right, how are we going to implement that? And the Nintendo 64 is you know, one of those scrollers, like, just like you said, some people say it's wacky and some people say, no, it's, it's genius. Um, you know, in the researching the book, I looked for top 10 controllers and t- top 10 worst controllers. And it was kind of evenly sp- split with it being on the top of the best controller list and on the top of other people's worst controller list. Lots of love and hate. It doesn't surprise me. I think the people who really like N64 controllers have three hands. <laughs> but I always liked the Z trigger on the N64 controller. Oh, it's perfect. The way the stick is yeah, designed and the trigger is right underneath. <laughs> That's what you feel like every time Every time you click that Z trigger. It's like you're shooting, a shooting off nukes. <laughs> yeah, they did a really good job with that. I've, yeah, I've, I have a, another controller. A, it was a third-party controller that's got some buttons down made for kind of holding the same way but they don't they don't balance as well as the Nintendo 64 controller does you you hit those buttons and you kind of feel like you're twisting the controller which makes your thumbsticks move a little bit but on the Nintendo 64 I never get that feeling that by pressing the Z button I'm going to move where I'm aiming so they the designers on that did a very good job of making whatever center of gravity or whatever it is that they needed to do. And when they were new and not as um, <laughs> broken in, boy, that stick would snap back to center oh, yeah. really, really easily. And you got to love all the colors that this controller came in. Well, that too. Even around this time, they certainly tapped into the uh, potential of making so many variants of their products. Yeah. Finding out that people will buy them. They'll buy every color. You never had to worry about <laughs> which controller you're holding. On the other hand, you had Sony and they made gray controllers. And gray controllers. Gray controllers and... Did they even make a black controller for the original PlayStation? (laughs) I am thinking and I... I don't... I don't think so. Only what came with the net yarrows as far as I'm concerned. It was gray and white. There was a white controller, right? The PS1 when they released the, the almost... Almost portable version. The uh, small. Yeah, it, it came with the white controller, and there was a, a clear yes. controller as well. You know what? I think I had one of those clear ones. Really? Yeah, clear Dual Shock. Now, also at that time, we had the Saturn, mm-hmm. and the Saturn seemed to kind of approve upon the standard Sega oh, six-button yes. controller, and I think they threw in shoulder shoulder buttons on that one. But we also had the Knights into Dreams controller. So, if anybody is not familiar with that controller, imagine a Dreamcast controller without a VMU slide in the middle. And that's that's it. That's the that's 3D pad, and it's black. Pretty much. Well, in the U.S., it's black anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Sega put the 3D analog stick off to the side and six action buttons and two triggers. It's I mean, it is uh, basically the Dreamcast controller. That is directly where it came from. I had a friend who had one of those, and I actually thought that thing was pretty good. Yeah, at least at the time. Yeah, uh, Sega had an interesting. They had some patents. So we have the VMU and the rumble packs that would fit into the slots on the Dreamcast controller. Doing that came from the, they had a plan on the Sega Saturn. The cord as an attachment, it can come off of the controller and then you could put different attachments inside there. They had a whole bunch of patents, like um, you could make it wireless or add a joystick to the back of it or a, a trackball. They had a memory card reader, a whole bunch of stuff that they had said that they thought you might be able to put in there to that, that accessory port. Now that's really fascinating and then they seem to kind of give up on the Saturn and, yeah. and shelve all that into the design of the Dreamcast controller. Yeah, I guess it was just too close to the end of the Saturn's life cycle to actually release any of those. Which is disappointing, that, that could have been fun. So then you had the VMU. So can you talk about the VMU really quick? Can you talk about the control of the VMU? And I realize you're going to be talking about a controller in a controller, basically. <laughs> so the VMU was it was a memory card that also had a little screen and it had uh, a little direction pad and an A and a B button. And it was for rudimentary games that would have four directions on A and B. So several Dreamcast games, you could save a mini game to your VMU and play it away from your console. You put it in your pocket and play with it on the bus or whatever you like. Yeah, I feel like they were getting inspired by 
the popularity of like those Tamagotchi games and Digivices and yeah, all of those things. Yeah, a lot like that. As well as taking advantage of the concept that the Nintendo 64 controller put out with expansion slots, and then ha- even pushing it further, where some games even utilized the screen while you were playing the game. And the one that always stood out in my mind was Resident Evil Code Veronica, where you were able to see your life meter and a couple other stats on that while you were playing, so you wouldn't have to, you know, go into your menu. I can't think of many other examples right now. I, I believe that some... Football games will allow you to play select on the VMU screen as well. So that you're okay if you're playing side by side two player, you can pick your your plays without your other friend knowing you're going for the blitz. <laughs> now, and this is to me at that time like I thought this was amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, I think the Dreamcast was just too early. I wish that that release had worked out better too early and too late yeah a little bit of both <laughs> uh, you know uh, that and all the the ill will yeah the ill will from you know doing the genesis 32x cd attachment to the saturn you know all it's like six months or something in between each of those and yeah by the end you're like i spent all this money and and now you're abandoning it but the dreamcast truly was something special uh, especially with online play yeah it was but after we lost sega we had the new contender come in with microsoft and launching with those large duke controllers yeah I, i've got a great story about that <laughs> let's hear it so in between starting the book and Getting to the finish line, we learned a little bit about why they're so big. You know, people like to say they just thought it should be bigger for us, you know, big American hands. But I think that was a bit of a cover story to cover for how inexperienced Microsoft was with doing hardware. You know, they've been software all the way up to this point, and then they decided to do all the hardware design on their own. That's I think you know I think the size of the original Xbox was part of that it's just you know how it's so large so the controller is so big you know there, there was a list of all the things that needed to do and basically you needed to do all the things that the dreamcast controller did uh, got the two expansion slots has all those analog sticks and buttons but they gave the job to an inexperienced employee who didn't really know how to do that sort of thing and they had a little bit of a lowest bid problem where they went with a manufacturer that also didn't really know how to make controllers. And so in the end, to get everything crammed in that they wanted on the PCBs that that company could design, this is how big it ended up being. They, they realized just too late in the design cycle that it had to be this big to fit everything in. I guess whoever should have been in charge of who the person who was in charge didn't check in often enough. So they, they realized it before they were released it, that it was going to be too big. They went with it so there would be a controller on launch day. But even before the Xbox launched, they had already started trying to build a smaller controller, the controller S that we ended up with. And that was something I discovered more when we were doing research for the Korean Xbox that we picked up. I, I really thought that they had designed the S controller for everybody. But in particular, it turned out it was the Japanese and Asian markets that pushed back the, the heaviest yeah. before it had even released over here. Yeah, they they saw it and said, you guys are crazy. We don't <laughs> even have room in our living room for that. <laughs> so like I said, they had already started working on that smaller controller. As soon as they realized that they were going to be stuck with the Duke for the release, they, they were working towards getting that better controller. And I, and I think the S is a is a pretty good design. It, it's compact, it's got everything it needs to do. It did move the white and black buttons. So you remember the, the original Xbox has your, your typical four face buttons, but it also had white and black buttons, which on the original Duke, they were laid out so that you had the two rows of three with the white and the black being on top. And then with the S, they redesigned it. They got put in the bottom and that kind of affects how your fighting games are set up. So if you've got you know, your low punch, medium punch, high punch in that order, so if that would have been X, Y, white, when you move those white and black buttons down, it, it kind of changes how you, how you do those fighting games. Yeah, when the Xbox came out, my cousin got one, and eventually she got the S controller too. So she had the original Duke and then the S, 
and I would come over and play it, and my little preteen girly hands just could not wrap around the Duke controller properly, and I would just beg her, please let me play <laughs> on the S. Like, it was bad. Yeah, the, the Duke was the one you gave to visitors. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I will admit, and I am I am one of the people who likes the Duke controller. I've got, I've got the big hands, so it feels really comfortable for me. I like it, but I know it's not, it is not for everyone. Honestly, I didn't think it was that bad. My friends and I, I remember at the time, we would joke about playing Halo and be like, be like man, you gotta use your elbow to, to do a melee. <laughs> <laughs> so then at this time, we have another controversial controller, and that's the GameCube. Personally, I love the thing. I know that a lot of people hate it. You know, it's, it's the, the, the GameCube had the offset analog sticks the way that the Xbox controller has. You know, the PlayStation's got the two analog sticks at the bottom and you know, nice mirror, and the GameCube's got the, the offset really saying, hey, you need to be using this analog stick with your left hand, not, the, not that silly D-pad. I think they did a good job of emphasizing that and giving it a, a very clear two-handed hold. I think it's a good controller, and I'm always a fan of offset sticks. That's something that really annoys me about PlayStation controllers. You know, I like my offset. I, t I play the Xbox more often than I play PlayStation now. I'm not sure if I could go back to the two at the bottom. And with the GameCube controller, we also have one of the first true actual functioning wireless controllers, the WaveBird. Yeah, WaveBird. So the WaveBird was a precursor to Bluetooth, but the sim same idea, first party wireless gamepad. It's a little bit bulkier. You gotta have room for the transmitter and, and your batteries, but it felt and played like a regular gamepad, which is different from the IR solutions that other consoles have. And they also had to ditch the rumble feature for this, didn't they? May maybe. I don't remember, actually. We have a WaveBird here, but we haven't played it in a while. I'm pretty sure it didn't rumble. I'm gonna have to find that out. Huh. I don't remember. Wow. Yep, you're totally right. Yep. No rumble feature on the WaveBird controller. You're, you're right. Memory has served me once today. <laughs> All right. But that then helps set a new standard in our next generation here with the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. Yep, all being wireless. Yeah, so the Xbox 360 and the Sony PlayStation 3, they came with the six axis first. They're both standard wireless controllers. The Xbox 360 still had wired controllers available, and that was used often by competitive players. They have slightly lower input lag. Yeah, I feel like Xbox and Sony thought that they had really good controllers the previous generation, so they just wanted to make a few tweaks, make these controllers even better, refine them, and then Nintendo comes out with the Wii and just <laughs> completely just crazy. blows everyone's mind with how strange that controller is. Yeah. I, I'm going to step back out on the, the Xbox 360, though. On the face of it, it does look a lot like that controller S. They hired an outside design firm Interesting. to help them refine that controller. It's not just so somebody took a block of clay and just shaped something a little bit different but kept all the, the same ideas. They did focus group testing and lots of models and a bunch of tweaks to get to where they were. They wanted to really improve on it. They didn't just keep the same thing with some superficial changes. It is an intentional improvement where the PlayStation is really the same controller with wireless. And let me backstep one more step, because we kind of glossed over PlayStation 2, because like you're saying, they didn't make too many changes, but also isn't that where they first introduced the pressure-sensitive face buttons? Yeah, basically every one of the face buttons is pressure-sensitive, all the way up to 255 increments. It was a neat idea, but there's only so much of a difference you can do in pressing that X button down, because the travel is so short, unlike the shoulder buttons where you've got a lot of travel, so you can actually make all those different increments. So I guess you could technically say, if I press the button harder, it makes it punch harder in the game. <laughs> yes, it actually worked, right? Yeah, so the PlayStation 2, you know, before that, you know, you'd make fun of your friends sitting next to you about mashing the punch button harder, but in the PlayStation 2, it, it actually did something, which was cool. Yeah, I didn't know they had that much levels of articulation in that. I did not know that. Amazing. Don't we still see that in our controllers today? You know, I Actually, I think that at least Sony dropped it because it ended up just not being used very much. You know, at one point we did, you know, driving games where hold down X to go fast. But then when the trigger, the shoulder buttons, when they got the analog, then you use that long travel of the, the right trigger to say a little bit of gas, more gas, all the gas. 
And so that's where Control has stayed. They, they, they just moved that okay. the gas pedal around to the, the, sh- the shoulder trigger instead of having it as a face button. Ah. Okay, okay. Do you cover any of the steering wheel and like even the gas pedal kind of controllers at all? No, I don't have any of those in the book either. Okay. I think we're shooting out some good ideas for the next book. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> And Steel Battalion. Oh, yes. Steel Battalion. Oh, my. <laughs> now, the release dates, I'm a little fuzzy here. Did the Wii come out before the PlayStation 3? No, it actually came out after. I don't have the dates either. But somewhere, PlayStation 3 got the great inspiration to fart around with the six-axis feature <laughs> of the controller. And I remember playing a friend's Metal Gear Solid 4, and any of those moments where you had to whip around the controller, oh my, it just made me angry, <laughs> and it's a feature that I'm glad they kind of gave up on. It, it's an interesting idea. Again, the Nintendo's figured out how to use that motion control very well, and they've helped their game developers use it, but it didn't work as well in the... For Sony. At least they didn't go with their weird boomerang controller that they showed way oh, back. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I, I love that. The original concept. Yeah. Can we touch upon that? How they thought they were going to really change it up? Or is that kind of like a fashion show thing where they just took it to an extreme just to yeah. get people talking? <laughs> I, I heard a rumor. Some guy on the internet, uh, he said that he worked adjacent to the group of people who would design that. Way back in the original PlayStation, there's a controller from Alps Interactive. That's blue and it has this boomerang shape. When they released that controller, they sent it to the Sony team. And apparently, a bunch of the designers saw it and they really liked it. And they kind of kept that idea in the back of their head. And it kind of manifested in that the PlayStation 3 beta, whatever, when they brought it out at the show. But yeah, it, it didn't last. It. I can't really imagine having to play holding that. I've, I've played, I've held the Alps controller and it's weird. I'm glad they stuck with their design. It's a good one. And that reminds me of a controller that, or like a computer gamepad that Microsoft made, I think it was, called the Sidewinder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that would, that would have been designed by Logitech, almost certainly, <laughs> but I don't, I don't have that one in my book either. Yeah, they were hideous, and they kind of had that boomerang-ish kind of <laughs> look to it. But now, do you know why the Wii controller was not originally released with one-to-one motion. It had an accelerometer, but it wasn't one-to-one until they invented the little add-on dongle. Do you know why that came later and not at launch? I, I don't know why, actually. It could have been just to keep the price of the components down. You know, Nintendo was shooting for the lower price mark. That might have had something to do with yeah, it. Yeah, because that was a really surprising thing for me when I got the Wii and found out it wasn't exactly one-to-one motion and I always wondered if Nintendo did that either for price or because they just didn't get the technology down in time for their release and it seemed like their fix was too late. Most people were done playing Wii Sports Resort and they had packed up their Wii by that time. Uh, they, you know, they did end up releasing a controller that had it built in. They had the regular Wii remote and then the Motion Plus accessory. And they did eventually release a controller that had the Motion Plus accessory built in. So it was the standard length. And then while we're still on Nintendo, what comes next? I don't know. It's not just a controller, but also <laughs> the controller, the screen, motion controls, camera, touchpad, but the Wii U gamepad seemed to have so much, it was almost too much. Yeah, obviously they, they like the idea because that's where the Switch is basically that with disconnecting controllers off to the side. I think the Wii U is one of those things where they, they tried something just to see what happened, like the when they did with the Virtual Boy. They just they tried it. And it, it worked well enough that the Switch takes a lot of those same design features, but they didn't, they didn't put a lot of energy into the Wii U. Not at all. But I actually really liked the system. I thought it had a lot more potential than it did, or, or at least uh, what was maximized out of it. And um, I I love the gamepad in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it was it was a uh, it was great. On uh, some you know some games it would it would have more information, kind of like the 3DS has with its two screens. You know, one screen would be the action, and one would be like your inventory. It would do that. I think for a few games you could actually play your game on the gamepad if that's what you wanted. Not, I don't think every game supported that, though. Not like the Switch. I did 
play Breath of the Wild sometimes in gamepad mode. Oh, yeah. So, I think however, they were on the right track. <laughs> however, with Breath of the Wild, I do wish on the Wii U version they left the original plan of having the gamepad serve as your map. Oh, yeah. So you wouldn't have to constantly be going back and forth to the map. My God. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the reasons it was discarded is just that the third party developers saw it as too much of a money sink to develop different versions of their games when it was just easier to make more or less direct ports for the Xbox, the PlayStation, and PC. Because they tried in the beginning. A couple of them tried. Like one of the Batman Arkham games, and they even made a, a Call of Duty, I think. Yeah, they did. <laughs> yep. So is too much innovation a bad thing when it comes to controllers? Not for Nintendo, obviously. They, but that, it always works out for them. Whatever they try, they they at least get something out of the experiment, and it doesn't hasn't stuck them yet. Well, you may not have the Switch if we didn't have the Wii U. Yeah, certainly. And I, I think the Switch is, you know, depending on what your goals are for gaming, it's about the pinnacle of at least gamepads, in my opinion. One one man's opinion. Now, the Joy-Cons, when they are attached to the Switch, I think are, are pretty good overall. Uh, when they're taken off, that's where I have a problem. It's It's the inverse of the Duke, where now the controller is too dang small. Yeah. The shoulder buttons are almost painful. And out of that, I think the Switch Pro controller right now for me is like the pinnacle of controller design. I think this thing is amazing. Yeah. And you certainly pay for the high quality. I think they run around $70. Oh, that, that sounds about right. So which, uh, which controller style does it follow? Does it have the, the analog sticks together in the middle or does it have them offset? I don't remember. They are offset. So it, it very much, I think, borrowed a lot from Xbox in that regard. But it also has more of the kind of like rounded yeah. feeling of the PlayStation 4 controller. It looks like a cross between the, the Xbox controller S and that Sidewinder we were talking about earlier. <laughs> in a way. Now talking about the PlayStation 4, there yeah, is... We, we <laughs> dropped the 6-axis... And now we have the new gimmick of the weird touchpad button thing. A lot of people seem very divided on that. Where do you stand? Well, you know, I'm a fan of trying stuff. If uh, you think you can make something special out of it, one of the problems with it is, you know, for a, on a, a game developer's standpoint, if they're making a new game and you know they want to be able to sell it across both platforms, you either do something very special on Sony that uses it, you know, uses it well. Or it, you have to use it like a gimmick because the Xbox One controller doesn't have anything similar. So I don't, you know, I can't think of any games right now that, you know, do anything special with the trackpad. It's just a way of doing input that you could probably do some other way if a developer wasn't just trying to use it because it's there. Exactly. And I think that it's more or less what we were touching upon with the Wii U. Yeah. And how conflicted third-party developers must have felt trying to make a game multiple platforms. I think it's a shame in a way that they have to have to operate like that, especially when the company goes through an effort to try and make their system or their controller stand out in a way and offering this feature and it just doesn't really get utilized in the name of you know, saving money. Yeah, I think that has, that has plagued Sony a lot. You know, getting away from controllers. I, you know, I bought the PlayStation 2 because there were so many promises of what it was going to be able to do. And you know, we got some of them. We did get the, the Ethernet modem and there was that Linux um, install package you could get. True. But it just never seemed to live up to the hype that you know they, they had all these neat features it was going to be able to have. And most of them showed up, but they just didn't they were just there. That was that's all they did was show up. And I'm a, you know, it seems like this trackpad is one of those things where you put it on a list of all the a, a new feature that the DualShock Four is going to have. It's got this trackpad. Lots of things you could do with it, but I don't really see it being used. Well, it was a hell of a DVD player. <laughs> they they fulfilled that one. Boy, it was. Yeah, that's right. That was my first they DVD were... <laughs> player. So my next question for you is. After doing all of this research, what was one of the weirdest controller or accessories you found? And then what was something surprising? The weirdest one, it doesn't show up in the book because I couldn't find a place for it. But apparently there's a horse veterinarian controller somewhere 
that's the backside of a horse with uh, an opening in it. That's probably the weirdest controller that I found while researching. I saw pictures of that. I thought that was a joke. I couldn't ever find it, but I have actually, I've seen enough games for teaching things like that that I, I, I think it probably exists, weirdly enough. That's probably the weirdest controller. What about a weird controller that ends up being in your book? Yeah, so up, uh, let's see, probably the weirdest controller that ended up in the book is the ASCII Sphere 360 for the original PlayStation. Is that that one-handed controller? No, this is not the one-handed controller. ASCII you know, has a, a very wide range of controllers that they've made, and, and they made several one-handed controllers. This one has a big ball on the top of it, on the, off to the side, where you do your control input. You can twist it, and you can pull and push on it, and you can do some other manipulations on it. It's good for descent, if you're familiar with that game, which is a very early 3D game that you can move six dimensions. It was good for that game, and that's probably the only game it was actually good for. And... What was like the most surprising thing that you found in your research that's in your book? The most surprising thing that I think that I found in my research was how early we had an analog stick on the gamepad. It was not the Nintendo 64. The first one was back in 1978. Wow. There's a series of systems called the Advanced Programmable Video Game System. It had a fully analog joystick back in 1978. And that was probably, that was surprising. I, I thought it was later than that. It didn't last. But that was, that was the first one. Very, very early on. Way ahead of its time. What is your all-time favorite controller? I think my all-time favorite controller is that Nagi Khan controller for the original PlayStation that Namco released. It, uh, it's kind of split in the middle so you can rotate it to give uh, analog feedback. They released that controller before the analog controller was ever released on the PlayStation. It's good for racing games. It's like having a, a wheel, except it's just a controller that you rotate in your hand. And I think it's a really a clever way of tweaking a gamepad. All right. So your book is The Evolution of Gamepads. And if people want to reach you on the internet, where would they do that? Do you have your own website? Yep, I have a website, uh, retrokevo.com, as I'm on there. And that'll give you all the links to Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all the normal places that people go on the internet. And your Twitter is at Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, Harbin, H-A-R-B-N. That is correct. And you could find your book... On Amazon and where else? And uh, through the publisher, uh, bookbaby.com. And I've got links to that on, on my website as well. And are there any other places people should know about how to reach you or buy your book? No, I think that about covers it. All right. Well, it's been fantastic taking down this uh, this trip down memory controller lane. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good talking with you all. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun. I, I do. I really enjoy your... Your podcast. I listen when I can. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to answer our questions. And your book definitely sounds really interesting. I think it will be a great collection piece to anyone who likes retro gaming history and learning about a lot of the strange accessories and controllers made over time. And you have a lot of wonderful, high-quality pictures of everything in your book. I think this is uh, something special, and uh, I don't know. I hope, I hope you make a, a sequel to this book with some other things, some other strange controllers and devices. That would be really awesome. Folks, you need to go out and buy this book. I think we're going to end up picking up a copy because we love having catalogs of, these, uh, of this history on hand and a great way to spur discussion with your friends when they're over. Start arguing about which controllers you like the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is fun. And now we're going to have a discussion with you, the listener. For Twitter tells the tales. I asked, what was your favorite controller? What was your least favorite controller? And if you owned any weird or odd controllers... And let me tell you, the answers are all over the place. Some people's favorites are other people's least favorites. There's a lot of discussion going on, a lot of controversy about these controllers. So let's see what you had to say. 
First on the chopping block is at Tall Gaming Man. His favorites are PS4, N64, and Dreamcast. Worst, the Xbox. Weirdest is probably the GameCube. I like the pad, but the button layout is a bit strange. Now, I didn't reply to him, but I'm wondering if he's referring to the Xbox original Duke controller, or has he not liked any Xbox controller since then? I'm guessing it's the Duke, because that one, you either had big paws and you liked it, or you didn't. Either way, I I personally prefer everything Xbox has done after that. Um, you know, the controller S, the 360 controller is fantastic, and I really haven't used too much of the Xbox One, but it seems pretty much the same. The GameCube controller did have a little bit of a weird layout. It's like Nintendo really wanted you to press that A button. I don't mind the button layout there. However, I feel like the thumb pad for the C-Stick is just too tiny. Otherwise, I like the GameCube controller. Very satisfying triggers. Next we have Pieces of Bits. He says his favorite is almost a tie between the Super Nintendo and the Genesis 6 button controller, but the Super Nintendo wins out with the superior D-pad. True. His least favorite is a tie between N64 and Dreamcast. Horribly awkward controllers for such great systems. Hey, I like the Dreamcast controller, but it's also been a while since I've used one. I thought the Dreamcast controller was a little bit on the clunky side, to be honest with you. It is. They, they definitely made a lot of room for that VMU unit. Yeah, but the VMU unit was a great idea, and I wish the Dreamcast would have taken that farther, but... At Ident Invalid says his favorite is the Mad Cat's Dreampad Dreamcast controller, the Xbox Duke controller, the stock Saturn Pad 1 and 2, the Atari 2600 wheel paddle. His least favorite is the Xbox controller S. WTF is with the black and white button placement, the N64, and GameCube. And like we mentioned in our discussion earlier with Mr. Kevin Harbin, when they had switched that black and white button, that that did change how you play certain games that utilize that, particularly fighting games. I also find it interesting that one of his favorite controllers was the Atari 2600 wheel paddle, but I bet you, if you plug that in, it's still going to work today. I like the wheel paddle for the games that require the wheel paddle. Like, kaboom! Next we have at a beer and a game. Their favorite is the six-button Genesis controller or the 360 controller. The worst was the ColecoVision controller. Well... Actually, the Intellivision is worse, but he doesn't have one. And the weirdest controller was the plug-and-play pinball system where you use the plunger to navigate the menus. It does sound a little strange, and yes, of course, those telephone hybrid controllers were just... What were they thinking? <laughs> <laughs> now, he posted a picture of that pinball controller, and, okay, imagine sort of like... It's sort of shaped like a PlayStation 2 where it has the two handles. And on the face of the controller, I mean, they're kind of being creative with it. It kind of looked like uh, two pinball um, flippers. And there's two buttons on either side to control each flipper. And at the bottom of the controller, they have a little little dongly plunger thingy. You know, the thing you use. For shooting the ball? Yep. Yeah, the springy mm -hmm. thing. I don't know what that's called. So I guess you would be able to use that. I've never held one. I thought they looked pretty strange. I saw that picture of the controller and it kind of looked like a weird insect to me. <laughs> okay. I, I just don't know if it's a, any good or responsive, but it, that definitely is one of the weirdest controllers I've seen. Look that up if you want to see that goofy... Insectoid pinball, pinball. controller. <laughs> At Oreo Speedwagon says Joy-Cons are the devil. And then I asked him about what was his opinion on Wiimotes. And he says the Wiimotes themselves are fine, in my opinion, just not the motion controls. Okay, so Joy-Cons, right? And you take the Joy-Cons off and try to use them one at a time or like one in each hand to do movements. I I'm not down with that at all no. whatsoever. God bless Nintendo at least for including the little hand pads so you could slide them in. So if you do play it with it docked or just... Um, away from the actual pad. I don't think it's that bad when it's in the controller form. Yeah, uh, it's comfortable when you have both of them in that little controller pad station thingy. That's pretty comfortable for me, and that's usually how I end up playing a lot of the games. But yeah, the Joy-Cons by themselves are just really, really tiny, and the L and R buttons on the top are just so awkward to hit. I do like the rumble, though. Yes, they, they do have really good rumble. Really good feedback. At La Cacalo says, My favorite controller has to be a DualShock 2 for the PS2. Least favorite would be 
bargain USB controllers that'll sporadically register random inputs, i.e. you're holding right but for a second the controller reads up left. As for the weirdest, would a Wacom Intuos count? Now that's kind of funny because the Wacom Intuos is one of those pressure sensitive drawing tablets for the computer and it does register as a mouse so I mean technically <laughs> Yeah, I guess you could play certain games with that. Oh, it'd be kind of funny to play like a first person shooter and just like poke people's heads to shoot the gun. I have to try that one day. I have an Intuos. <laughs> I wonder if you could emulate Mario Paint with that. Ooh, you could be a Mario Paint master with that. <laughs> Imagine uh, playing the fly game, fly swatting game with that. Did you ever have any bargain USB controllers? Not really. I've always made sure to stay away from those. Uh -huh. uh, I've known some people that did. It was really hit and miss, especially with Logitech. You know, sometimes I have no problem and other times it would break, you know, or just stop working yeah. soon after they bought it. Mm -hmm. And the PlayStation 2 controller, one of the best? What do you say? For its time. I think the PlayStation 2 controller is probably the most comfortable of all the PlayStation controllers. I just don't like sticks in the middle so close to each other. But it's still a very good controller overall. Yeah, it's solid. At Punk Rock Bob. Don't do the heroin, Bob. GameCube was the most awkward, hand-crampy thing ever. I have no clue why it survives all the way to the Switch for Smash Bros. Pure is still literally the worst. My favorite was the ASCII grip for PS1. It was fun to have a free hand for notes on RPGs or goofing within fighting games. I have never tried one of those. It looks strange to me, and while I played a lot of RPGs and was enticed by it, I never picked it up and never knew anyone who had one. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting choice for a favorite controller because I think most people would look at that controller and be like, yeah, I don't want to play a game with that. It looks like a DVD remote controller. <laughs> Are you really taking notes with that free hand? What is that free hand doing? <laughs> chugging Mountain Dew? Yeah, chugging Mountain Dew. Mm. But then, you know, you don't like the GameCube controller. I just don't know why the GameCube controller gets so much hate, because that is literally my favorite controller. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then Joey Sisko says, I have to agree. I never understood the GameCube controller hate. Part of me wonders if it's a hand size thing. It fits in my hand flawlessly, but anyone with bigger mitts is gonna have a bad time. Punk Rock Bob replies, that's a big part of it, or how I hold the controller, I guess. I normally can't comfortably game on a handheld without a grip of some sort, for example with my Vita. SNES is king for comfort, everything else is just a deviation from there. And he posted a picture of his PlayStation Vita with the grip add-ons. I have a Vita, I, I think it's, it's okay, though to be honest I haven't gamed on it too much, but... Overall, I like it. You think grips would make it more comfortable? That's a maybe. But it would definitely make it less portable. That's also a maybe. If you wanted to just slip it in and out of your pocket, sure. If you've got a little case to carry it around in a backpack, then yeah, no problem. And Ident Invalid replies, I'd have to have grips for the Vita. The stick placement looks uncomfortable for me already. But my hands are pretty tore up and aren't getting any younger. So definitely people are looking for comfort here. No matter what kind of research you do, you certainly can't make a one-size-fits-all. That is correct. You just do the best you can. At Catatomical says the favorite is the GameCube Wavebird. Oh yeah. The least is that abomination from Mega Drive. Not my pick, but I have one and it's terrible. Current weirdest is the air pad for PS1 and possibly the 2. It has a tilt mechanism and for some reason a removable cover. So he posted the picture of the Turbo Touch 360, which we talked about with Kevin Harbin, the black and yellow Genesis controller. It had the three buttons with turbos on it on the right hand side, pretty normal, but on the left hand side it was that weird almost quasi touchpad eight-way directional thing. I don't think it would have worked well at all, and I could see why it was a failed product. No, technology wasn't there, and boy though, the companies with their marketing really wanted to make you believe it was. Yeah, this is going to make you really good at video games, kids. And then the AirPad controller is round. I mean, it is a circle. I don't know what they're going for here. Big ol' circle. <laughs> Uh, well, I believe it It was oh, it tilts. had motion control. Yeah, so you wouldn't rest so... it on your desk. So I guess uh, you throw it around like a Frisbee. I, I think it was just so large to try and fit that tech in. True, true. Um, and I bet it was horrible. This would make a really good controller to throw at someone. That's all I could think of. It's like a big Frisbee. Yeah, hey, you get mad at a game and you just whip it. Mm -hmm. At Benderman42 says... He never owned the NES, but he always hated the square plastic block controller. Not ergonomic at all. He 
He thinks the worst controller that he's ever owned was the Atari Jaguar controller. Oh, I feel sorry for you. And his favorite right now is probably the PlayStation 4 controller, but the Xbox One controller is a fairly close second place. Timeline-wise, that makes sense, right? The first mainstream console controller he didn't like, but where we're at now, he's really enjoying. I think that's a well-reasoned response. Well, things got worse before they got better, because the NES controller might have not been too comfortable with those edges, but the D-pad and buttons were great. And then it got worse with the Atari Jaguar controller, and that's another controller that had the weird number pad, like the Intellivision and ColecoVision. True, and I, I think they made versions of that controller without it. Yeah, I've seen those before. But yeah, the PlayStation 4 controller is okay, in my opinion. I don't like the big touchpad thingy in the middle of the controller. I think it's kind of awkward. And once in a while, my thumb will bump it and my game will do things I don't want it to do. It's mainly that share button. I hit that like on accident all the time. I don't even know how. Yeah, I really haven't played too much Xbox One, but they seem to be pretty solid with their controller design. I'll say too about the PS4, even though we're not moving the sticks like I want, they did change something, made it more round, changed the angle of how the actual grips fit in your hand. And I, I really do like it in that regard. Also, when I was a kid, I never really thought the NES controller, I guess the way it fit in my hands back then, it was fine. But definitely as I got older playing with those, I'm like, holy cow, there's a dent in my hand <laughs> after playing for a while. At the underscore Stone Creek says favorite goes to the Genesis 6 button and Saturn non-analog pads. Worst ever is without a doubt that N64 abomination. Yeah, actually, the Saturn gamepad was pretty darn good. It was basically the Sega 6 button, but with some shoulder buttons and uh, I think a little bit better design. I don't remember, because it's been way too long since I played a Saturn, at how good or bad the D-pads were. But the Genesis D-pad was a bit stiff. Yeah, unfortunately, I never had a Saturn, and I think I only knew one person who had one. So I really can't remember in my head how I like the Saturn controller. That's one that just escapes me. But the N64 controller is like the king of awkward controllers. And I would always hate it when I would invite like friends or, you know, my cousins would come over and they would play the N64 and they, and they didn't have one. And they would hold the controller, what I considered the wrong way, where they would have their left hand where the yep. D-pad was. Yep. And they were still trying to use the analog stick mm -hmm. by like stretching out their thumb. And it just... I was like, like no, no, don't hold it like that. And the Z trigger's there. You got to have your hand there. Yeah, I would just, Nintendo, why? I know, I know. And then they had the audacity to still have that left trigger all the way over there. Oh, the, the L the button? The left shoulder button, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm also really glad they abandoned splitting up the C. Uh, I, that's this, no, don't ever do that again. I don't think they maybe had the technology or maybe it was too expensive to do two analog sticks on one controller. Just one analog stick was enough for them. I guess so, and they needed extra buttons, and in the end, I guess it works out okay to have a game tell you C up, C down, C left, C right, instead of like A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, <laughs> 1, whatever they would have called those extra buttons, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know... When I was a kid playing the N64, the C buttons never bothered me. We have, at Urza's Rage, the best D-pad that I own that clicks is the Xbox One or NVIDIA Shield. Whoa, you have one of those things? The best D-pad that doesn't click is always going to be the Sega Saturn. The best analog is the Xbox One, I guess. Or the shape of it. He's not fan of the PlayStation mushroom analog sticks. I agree. I don't like PlayStation sticks. What I think Xbox got right with their controller was they made the sticks have like the concave dip inward yes. and the PlayStation comes outward. And it's so much easier for your thumb to rest in that little indent in the Xbox controllers. They got that right. But these newer PlayStation controllers, they the sticks at least have really good snap. That is true. I'll and, give them that. And when I was a kid on my PlayStation 1 controller, I actually took off the rubber things on the top. <laughs> so, on your, uh, your original DualShock? Yeah, my original du DualShock does not have the rubber thingies. It's just flat on top. Wow. I liked it better that way. I knew someone who had like a pet bird and they would let it out. And eventually the bird had landed and like pecked off. 
a whole bunch of the the covering on those sticks. <laughs> that poor bird probably ate some. Yeah, I had come over, had, or he just tore it up because he was like, you know, angry that he can't fly and leave, <laughs> go outside. And I come over, and his sticks were just all chewed up. You at Winstolf. Shout out to the well-read mages. Contributor to the well-read mage. You should look that up. Good guys over there. Good podcast. And you could find articles at thewellreadmage.com. They publish a lot of stuff. They got a lot of people making some really good content. He says, my least favorite was the N64. Exactly what species was it designed for? My favorite is probably going to have to be the X360, which was a pure ergonomical delight. Most unique for me, Dreamcast, with its little screen. Aww. Yeah, the Xbox 360 controller was extremely comfortable, but they were kind of finicky in a way. I I knew a lot of people, me included, that had Xbox 360 controllers that would just randomly die. I still use them. Unfortunately, the only ones we have are the AA battery versions. And yes, those are ones where the battery packs have gotten a little loose over time. Sometimes you're playing... You wave your hand a bit or whatever out of anger or excitement and your battery pack comes loose and there goes your controller. I would like to get my hands on some of the rechargeable battery ones, but I really like the computer. I have a dongle for my computer so I can use them in in video games. You said dongle. Dongle. Yeah, I have one of those too and they're they're great for, uh, you know, if you ever want to use a controller on the PC. And another hater for the N64 controller. Oh, poor N64. We have another tweet by... At games underscore nomad. Favorite controller is the PlayStation 4. It's the most comfortable one I've used. Least favorite is the Wii Remote. It gives me awful hand cramps. The weirdest one was a GameCube controller that was a nightmare to use, and it was a USA Pro Racer controller. He describes it. Evil is what it is. You have to sort of twist and move the side parts of the controller up and down to turn left or right. And it's the worst controller I've ever used, and that's for sure. If you want to look this up, go ahead. It's kind of like a GameCube steering wheel-esque controller. It kind of looks like the GameCube controller. It's purple and has similar button placement, but the bottom of it is circular. You know, think steering wheel. Now, I've never used one of these things before, so I can't say personally exactly how it controls, but I'm going to take his word for it. Not good. Yeah, I'm not willing to try it, no. Strange looking controller. Look it up. USA Pro Racer controller for the GameCube. And yes, I hate the Wii remotes. I hate them. I kind of like how the left, how the one part of the nunchuck almost felt like I was holding the center of an N64 controller. You had your stick, you had your trigger, but overall, absolutely not. No, the Wii controller was really strange, and I didn't like the nunchuck attachment because yeah. it was like free floating. I didn't like that. No, I, I don't like any of it. I, I, I would rather have my controller be one thing and not yes. like a nunchuck. <laughs> and when you turn the remote sideways, it's just ugly. Yeah, that wasn't the button placement on no. that wasn't good sideways, and those things were always like disconnecting. It ate batteries. Junk. And then, you know, later on, they came out with the Motion Plus controllers, or you could buy those other little add-ons for your regular Wiimotes to make it a Motion Plus, and just things for that. You know, the one thing I do appreciate about those controllers was the Wii Classic controller. Yes. That one is actually one of my favorite controllers. Not my favorite. It's nice. You got your two sticks in the middle. It feels like a slightly bigger Super Nintendo controller. I really it's not bad. Lo- yeah, it worked. Yeah, I really, really loved their ZL and ZR buttons. Yeah. I just they had the best satisfying little springy click. I love that. Yeah, when we would play a couple of games with that, I would use that controller. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were playing Wii U, Mario Kart on Wii U, yeah. we, remember we plugged up the nunchuck and I plugged that in? That worked? I was using that, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we have a third-party controller yeah, for the Wii U. Yeah, you're using that knockoff Pro Controller. Which was really, really good, by the it's way. It's pretty good. It's one of those see-through ones that glows different colors, and it's kind of in the same style as almost like the Xbox 360 controller mm. with the two analog sticks. It emulates their Pro Controller. The sticks are both yeah. up top. They're not offset. You kind of have that awkward buttons underneath the stick, but... It worked. I liked it. It did all right. Solid third-party controller. Surprisingly. At Richard Troop, my favorite controllers are the Super Nintendo, Jaguar, yes, really, and Xbox 360. 
My least favorite is the N64 controller. I just don't like how it feels in my hands. Either too squashed up or too far apart, dependent on holding. Weirdest I own is either Amiga CD32 or ColecoVision. I was waiting for somebody to mention something a little strange, like Amiga CD32 controller. Yeah, I've never held one before. Same. But I think you you need like a, an award for liking the Jaguar controller. And now, I'm curious to know if that is like the Jaguar controller with the number pad or without the number we pad. We should have asked him to clarify. Yeah. That's our bad. Dang. But if you like it with the number pad, then I, I don't know what to say. We have a tweet by at WickedV1. His favorites would be the Super Nintendo, GameCube, mouse and keyboard, and the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One controller. His least favorite is the Wiimote and Sega. Wow. Okay, I'm sorry, sir or ma'am or zir. <laughs> We're talking about controllers, not mouse and keyboard. Thank you. Well. Technically, I would count mouse and keyboard as a they way. They are not controllers, no. But they are a way of controlling. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I like mouse and keyboard too. Yeah, mouse and keyboard is one of my favorite. I got a really good gaming mouse, by the way. It's it, it was a it was thirty dollars and some weird off brand, but it's my favorite. It's called Rapu. I'm not kidding. R A P O O. Rapu. I'm using a HyperX Cherry Red keyboard. I, I like it a lot. Oh, we're going to talk about keyboards now. Yeah, just very quickly. You know, he brought it up. It's his fault, not mine. Okay, you like the red switches. You like that super fast action. Yes, with some noise, but not too much noise. And I like the uh, blue switches. And my mouse is just an average Logitech. A slightly above average Logitech. At Coffee for Binky says, This awful one, the Sega Saturn controller. Downright hurts the fingers. I am curious to know, do you not like the ABC buttons or the smaller buttons that are above the ABC buttons? They're not that much smaller. There's a little bit of a size difference. I just, I'm just curious. Or is it the D-pad? Or is it just the whole hunkin' plastic thing? I mean, I, there's a, they put in a little extra space, like extra beef around the D-pad and the buttons toward the bottom. Yeah, I, I thought... I could see how that would bother smaller hands, maybe. Definitely, because from what I could remember, I thought the Saturn controller was bigger than the Genesis controller. It is. I think maybe that's why. There's just more plastic... Even the six button. Yeah, there's just more for your hand to wrap around and... I didn't think it was that know. bad, but I also didn't play many fighting games whenever I did play the Saturn, so I'm not sure how good or bad that d-pad is but mm -hmm. uh for games i did play it was fine i'm surprised no one mentioned like arcade sticks being their favorite that's true especially now that there's all these really crazy custom boards that people make and you could order them and they do all sorts of things really surprised no one mentioned that so we have the most controversial controller according to your tweets is the GameCube controller because it appears on a couple of people's least favorite lists and it appears on a couple of favorite lists, including mine. So people are very, very split about the GameCube controller. You either loved it or you hated it. But the controller, according to these tweet replies, that is the least favorite by a mile, <laughs> by a long shot. The Nintendo 64 controller. That is the least liked controller of all the controllers, it seems. From a huge pool of, you know, like 10. <laughs> 10 to 15 <laughs> tweets, yes. <laughs> Maybe we should have just put out a poll, too. Oh. Oh, well, too late for that. Let's put it out right now. No. But that's okay. We still like the N64 controller for what it is. And... Like we mentioned earlier in the episode, if you don't really like it, but you still want to get your Nintendo 64 fix, check out RetroFighters.com for their awesome Brawler 64 controllers. Those look like they're so comfortable, really. It looks legit. Too legit to quit. I want one. I want two. And if they're good, I, I might even get four. Yeah, especially if you get them in all the crazy colors. I'm a little shocked that no one mentioned the awesome... Panasonic 3DO controller. I mean, how cool was that thing? Uh -huh. Solid three buttons. Looks like the best D-pad ever made. Um. Yeah. What a great controller that looks like it was. Well, 
Thank you, everybody, for your Twitter replies. Thank you for telling the tales of your best and worst and weirdest controllers. It's because of people like you that we make the podcast. Because if you've played it, if you've experienced it, if you grew up with it, that makes you a bit war veteran. And this is what it's all about. Just sharing our stories, our tales, and making memories that are going to last forever. Or for as long as the internet is around. By the time you're hearing this podcast, we will be making our way to Japan for vacation. And then back to the States to see some family. We are going to be spending a week in Tokyo. We've never been to Japan before. Trust us, we'll be all over Akihabara. We'll be all over all the arcades, the retro game stores, all the crazy things Japan has to offer. So listen to our podcast next month. Because we will tell you all about it. Pay attention to our Twitter, our YouTube, and Bitwar Vets on Twitter. And you can follow me at Meowte Ching on Twitter. YouTube.com slash Bitwar Veterans, where we will be sharing pictures and video and stories and retro finds and arcades. And then when we go back to the United States, we will be going to the Galloping Ghost Arcade, one of the largest arcades left in the United States. So we'll be talking about that too. We're just gonna like, the whole next episode will just be about everything we did on vacation. <laughs> it's a great place, and if some of you are in the area, maybe you can meet us there. Yeah, it's very close to Chicago. Thank you everybody for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We're really excited to bring you the next episode after a refreshing and fun vacation. And if you've made it this far, then that means you and we are fit. Four veterans!